Hello, my name is Andrew, and you're listening to Working for the Word. And in this episode, I'd like to tie up our series on an experiment in oral scripture adaptation. So far, we've seen a lot of interesting things along the way, but this episode, I think, might be the most interesting for a lot of you. It's one of the most exciting ones for me, and you'll see here very soon why that is. So what I want to talk about today is what we discovered in the midst of doing this experiment, what we discovered as parallels between the culture of the Fong people and the culture of the ancient Near Eastern world of the Old Testament. So what that means is we kept running into all of these things in the Fong culture that were very similar or exactly like the weird things, weird to us Westerners, modern people, that we find in the Old Testament world. Now, a lot of these things, like concubines and other things that we see in the Old Testament, we've kind of gotten numb to or really used to. We're just used to the Old Testament having a lot of weird things, so we stop thinking about it, kind of glaze over them. But when you really stop and think about the world of the Old Testament, the way the Old Testament writers wrote, the kinds of things that happen in it, the more and more (laughs) you just have to admit there's some really strange stuff going on. Now, it's one thing to take a course about all of these ancient customs and cultures and try to get a grip on it as a modern Westerner. But it's another thing to actually be immersed in, every day, a culture that is very similar to those ancient cultures, that parallels it, to be around that for years on end. That's very different. Because it's one thing to just kind of mentally assimilate these ideas and these strange customs. And it's another thing to live in the midst of them with them going on all around you all the time for you to start seeing how it could be normal and feel normal. And that's basically what I experienced in Equatorial Guinea. And my wife got a taste of it as well, even though she wasn't there as long as I was. So all that to say, one of the most exciting things about doing this oral adaptation project was that I was constantly talking with the translator about some of these cultural issues. Because when you're a consultant on a project and you're sitting there with a translator talking about a new idea that you you think may be new to them because it's from the ancient Near East... You have to anticipate these sorts of things. You have to ask them questions like, what do you guys do with blessings and cursings? Do you guys do blessings in your culture? Do you speak blessings over people? What about multiple wives? What about sacrifices and idols and paying the bride price? Those sorts of things. So I was constantly running into these things after long conversations with the translator who was an incredible source of knowledge. He was like an encyclopedia. There was actually a, a friend of mine who would call him the encyclopedia because he would he was younger and he would go to ask him all of these questions. And he would know so much about the traditions and culture that is now fading fast because of globalization. So what are some of these interesting things? Let's let's talk about them. First I want to talk about some parallels. Let's start with the existence of famous sorcerers or powerful sorcerers that would be in the leadership among the sorcerers like in Egypt. If you remember, that's a key part of the story of Egypt. And the same in the Fang culture. There would be people you'd go to in a crisis who have extra power and can help solve that crisis and who call themselves sorcerers. Imagine that. (laughs) It's not a big jump to try to imagine that because that's already normal for them. So they have this advantage of being able to read the Old Testament without having to stretch themselves too far to think, oh man, I don't know how I can process this. This just seems so weird, so foreign to them. That whole concept was natural. For us as modern Westerners, sorcerers are a thing in old movies movies about fantasy, all that kind of thing, and we don't really take it seriously. It's not a part of everyday life. It just makes it sound like a fairy tale to us when we read this kind of thing. But for them, it sounds real because it is real and it was real. So that we have to struggle so much to enter the biblical world so much more than they do at this point. 
Also, they have town shrines with wooden idols in Fang villages. They also do animal sacrifices traditionally. They also believe that blood is powerful for witchcraft. They make marks and tattoos on their body associated with witchcraft. And they also make their children jump through fire as a part of a ritual. So let's look at that one first. Uh, in comparison to Ezekiel 20, 31, it says, When you present your gifts and offer up your children in fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. So although that they wouldn't actually burn their children as burnt offerings like in the Bible, there was this association with it. Now what about making marks and tattoos on their bodies associated with witchcraft? Well, in Leviticus 19.28 we read, You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. So obviously, if you're making cuts on your body for the dead, there's something going on that is more like witchcraft than not there, right? And so much of what God is instructing the Israelites to do in the law, in the, in the Old Covenant, in Exodus and Leviticus, Deuteronomy, is going against the norm, going against the grain of a world of witchcraft, and if you don't understand what it is like to live in a world of witchcraft, it's going to be really hard to understand the Old Testament. So in EG, Equatorial Guinea, you're constantly seeing people with these kind of scars, scars on their faces, scars on other parts of their body that they were given as children for different reasons associated with witchcraft. That is a normal part of life. So when they read Leviticus 19, it's not like, wow, that's really strange and out of the blue and legalistic. It's like, no, this is the difference between our old, horrible, dark lives that we lived in fear and slavery to these occult forces and coming into the light. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different way of looking at it than we do in the West. Now what else? Traditionally, in Equatorial Guinea, people have had multiple wives. And they have wives that are more loved than others and all of that kind of thing. And it is totally normal traditionally for them to give their husband another woman to have children with if they can't have children. For their thinking as a culture, for those who are not believers, that would be a no-brainer. A total no-brainer. It's not like some scandalous, crazy thing that you would only see on a, a reality show. It is something that is totally normal traditionally for them, historically. And um, so, yeah, reading the Old Testament when that kind of thing happens with Sarah and Abram is not a big deal. It's not only not a big deal, but it feels like, oh, this could have happened here, right in our country. Now, moving right along, when we got to Judges 19 with the translator, it says, In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem and Judah, and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. Okay, so here's the scenario. Not as bizarre to us Westerners as other things, but when we talk to the translator, basically, here's, here's what it boiled down to. In their culture, it was very normal to have arranged marriages. So a man would pick a girl when she was very, very young. Sometimes she could be a baby. Sometimes she could be 10 years old, 8 years old, 12 years old. So he would pick her as a wife, and she would come and be raised in his village, among his people, among his family. Why did they do this? Well, one of the reasons was so that when she grew up, she would be already used to his people, and it wouldn't be such a big shock to move away from home and everything. So 
she would grow up being sort of part of the larger family. And uh, often she would grow up thinking that her husband was her uncle, even though they had already done the wedding, but he wouldn't be allowed to touch her until she was 23 years old. And so then it would be revealed to her that this is your husband. And <laughs> that could be a shock. And sometimes that girl would run away and run back home. Sometimes if the girl was older when she was chosen and got married and didn't have a say in it, then she would also run away back home. And the husband, if he was a good husband or if he wanted to save face in the shame and honor culture, he would go and get her back. So our translator made it clear to me that this happened pretty often. And so he would have to go sometimes multiple times to go get his wife back. So as I already touched on, this leads us into the issue of arranged marriages. Totally normal for them, traditionally. Nothing strange about that. That was the way things were done. So when they read the Old Testament, they're not freaking out. They're not saying, man, this is so hard to identify with like we do. For instance, when Abraham sends his servant to go find a wife for Isaac, oh, that's totally normal for them. They don't have to try to put any footnotes in there or any study notes or explanations or tone it down to make people understand or not be weirded out by the Bible. When they translate this as it is, it just fits like a glove on their culture. Honestly, I remember being one of these modern Western people who would read about this kind of stuff and hear about what they do in India, for example, or in Africa or whatever, about arranged marriages. And I would just kind of take it with an amused tolerance, like, huh, those poor, ignorant, strange people, or, or isn't that kind of funny that people do such ridiculous things in other parts of the world or in other parts of history. But as you can imagine, that's not going to get you very far in growing an intimacy with the Bible, the biblical story, and getting a deeper, more mature understanding that's nuanced of Scripture. And it's not really going to help you build friendships overseas if you're constantly just sort of chuckling at these you know, quote-unquote ignorant people in India or whatever. Um, half today, as I understand it, half of marriages in India still are arranged marriages. Um, and that's a statistic, and that's not going to move you. But when you start delving into that world, and like I lived in Equatorial Guinea for seven years, and and you have that kind of thing all around you, you're going to start thinking, huh, there's, there may be some wisdom in this, and I shouldn't be so quick to judge the Bible by my own standards, is one of the conclusions, right? Because my standards in my cultural moment are not going to help me take the Bible seriously as a real part of history. And this is, this is key so listen to me here. This is important, I think, because this causes, maybe not conscious, but it causes an erosion of confidence in the Bible. Because if we come at it from our cultural superiority, thinking all of these people, including the writers, were just these poor, primitive people, so primitive in all of their understanding and practices, primitive and ignorant, right? So you just pat the Bible on the head and say, oh, you cute, primitive little culture. You didn't have all the privileges that we do, all the amazing advances in culture and technology that we do today. And so there's this undercurrent, I think, in a lot of the modern West that is condescending towards the Bible and patronizing. It's not outright, direct, or explicit, but I think it's there hidden in the corner of a lot of people's hearts. And a lot of that is brought about because of these severe disconnects between our cultures.
and our inability, especially as Americans who are so monocultural and monolingual, to be able to identify with other cultures and especially other moments in history. So moving on, we already touched on the bride price, but I want to reiterate that I was surrounded by that practice. In Equatorial Guinea, you cannot legally be married unless you have paid for your wife. That is still the status today. So this was the world that I lived in, day in and day out. You know, when you talk to people about relationships and the common struggles of everyday life, this is the kind of thing that comes up. You know, I'm, I'm saving up for the bride price or I don't have enough money for the bride price. Will you lend me some money? Will you give me some money? Uh, I've gifted a lot of people money for these sorts of things to help out because often the parents of the girl ask for ridiculous amounts of money or, or you know, a car or, you know, a house or anything. It's It's really up to them and they can make it very difficult for people to be married legally. And so what that does in the church is it makes things more complicated because if you're poor and you can't get married legally and it forces a lot of people or tempts a lot of people to end up living together unmarried for a long time until they have enough money to actually have the wedding legally paying the bride price. And um, there's a whole host of issues that go with that because if you are the husband and you haven't paid the bride price and you have children with this woman, those children 100% belong to her. You have no claim on them. If you pay the bride price, then the children born to you after that, you have 100% claim on them as the man. So if your wife leaves you, if you have a, if you have a divorce or whatever, the man has 100% rights to them, no no debate. Um, so then a lot of people will encourage their daughters to go ahead and have some kids out of legal marriage so that if something goes wrong in the marriage, they get to keep the kids. And so you can imagine how this whole law uh, creates a whole world of chaos of problems with marriages and families and you name it, inside the church and outside of the church. Also, we've touched on the practice of older men marrying much, much younger women. This is totally traditionally common in Equatorial Guinea. Have a wife 20 years younger, uh, 30, 40 years younger. Now, this in the United States is not only disgusting, to 99% of North Americans, but it's unthinkable. And in Equatorial Guinea and in lots of places in the world besides, this is normal. This is not crazy and it's not weird and it's not perverted. It's just life. Now, the problem with us Americans is we can't use the Bible to back us up <laughs> because the Bible is going to betray us in this area. If you look at Ezekiel 16, for example, you have Yahweh himself who finds a baby who's kicking in her blood and he brings her back to life. He helps her survive and he waits until she's at the age for love and he marries her. So if he found her and rescued her when she was a baby, uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that there was just a, like a three-year age gap between them. And these kinds of age gaps are all over the Old Testament, if you've read any of it. So, let me ask you this question. If you are holding on to this mindset of, oh, age gaps between men and women in marriage, huge age gaps, are disgusting, unacceptable, perverted, and wrong, just wrong, are you really going to go deep into a mature appreciation of the Old Testament? Or are you going to end up staying in the rut of a patronizing attitude, maybe subconscious, to the Old Testament 
So the question is, how are we doing in our churches? You know, are we helping people get beyond their cultural fetters and embrace some of these things in the Bible as potentially valid ways of living and normal cultural practices? Or are we instead just helping people reinforce their cultural biases, their cultural myopia, and closed-mindedness? We also had a long conversation with Acasio, our translator, about concubines, and it was interesting. I can remember us talking about this casually around the lunch table and him saying, just as normal as could be, that he in his past life as an unbeliever had concubines. When was the last time you were in a small group setting and you're hearing someone's testimony and they talked about the concubines they had in their past life, you know? But this was a reality for him and a reality for a lot of people in the world to have concubines. And so when they read this kind of stuff in scripture, they not only have specific words for them, maybe even multiple vocabulary words to translate concubine in their language, but they also have no problem following the story and the implications of that. Another cool one was when we got to the point where Samson tells a riddle at his wedding, at the Philistine wedding. You remember that? He tells the riddle about the lion and the honey. Well, I asked the translator, Acasio, do you guys tell riddles? Number one, do you guys have a tradition of telling riddles of any kind? Do you even do that in your culture? He was like, oh yeah, for sure. And we do them at weddings. <laughs> so when that happens, it's just like, oh, well, of course he would tell a riddle at a wedding. Duh. But for us, that just comes across as so bizarre. I've never been to a wedding where anyone told a riddle as part of the ceremony or whatever, you know. So also we asked him, about this whole issue when a man dies, you know, in the story of Tamar, for instance, you have her brothers being given to her to substitute, to give her a son in their brother's place who died, right? Levirate marriage would be another term for it. it. Also happens in the book of Ruth. Remember, you know, Ruth her husband has died, and so she's trying to find the closest of kin, or, as, or actually Naomi is trying to find the closest of kin for her, and uh, ends up being this one guy, but Boaz ends up getting it, the rights because that guy's not willing to. And so, so we asked him about this. How does this come across in your culture? Do you guys have any practice that's similar to this? And he said, absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what they would do. If a man dies, the woman would be given to the man's closest relative, and there you go. The other issue that we ran into all the time was the mentality of marriage as utilitarian, not a romantic connection. So this is probably, I would say, dominant in the majority of the world, this mentality about marriage I personally hate it because <laughs> I'm I'm a product of my time in a lot of ways and uh, the the books that I read and other things and you know we could talk about this another day this isn't really something for this episode to talk about you know the biblical underpinnings for romance and that kind of thing but in Equatorial Guinea most marriages are p totally utilitarian so it's useful for everything but love. It's for survival. It's for getting children so they can work your farm. And it's for building a tie between another village or whatever. And you see this in the Old Testament all the time, don't you? You see marriage alliances being formed between kings and using their daughters in that way. You see marriage happening simply because you need to survive like Ruth and Naomi you know you're a destitute woman in the ancient Near East being single you just can't you can't survive as as a bachelorette you have to get married if you have if you want to survive and love romance all of that stuff is just a marginal at best issue in that decision that mentality was so common in EG and it really rubbed me the wrong way a lot of times and eventually 
I started to accept this as this kid, this could be normal. You know, this is, this is a way of, of seeing the world. Uh, and you know, husbands are called to love their wives, of course, biblically and to lay down their lives for them. But the idea of an apocalyptic romantic comedy, you know, this apocalyptic kind of in loveness feeling and whatever else that we idolize in the West is not necessarily how it has to be for the rest of the world. Now, obviously, I'm not going to encourage anyone to think this way and view marriage as solely utilitarian, but living in that culture immersed in this mentality helped me understand the Bible in a better way. It helped me become less patronizing towards scripture in this way. It reduced the temptation to view it as some kind of primitive nonsense, you know? Now, do I think that the Bible includes this kind of stuff in the narratives because it's condoning utilitarian marriage? By no means. Like a lot of things that we see the patriarchs do, I don't think the writers are trying to say, this is the model for you. I think a lot of the New Testament is trying to correct, you know, even Paul in Ephesians 5 is trying to correct that mentality and say, there's a better way to do marriage. So here's another bizarre one. The Fong traditionally practice circumcision. <laughs> How crazy is that? So, from as long as they can remember, circumcision has been really important to them. And they actually have a legend that I think I've mentioned in other episodes that they originally came from Egypt. Which, the more I look at these kinds of parallels, the more I'm not surprised if that ends up being true. (laughs) Because of all the parallels they have with the ancient Near East. So, they practice male circumcision. They also have taboos for certain foods because of things that happened to their ancestors. So, for instance, in Genesis 32, 32, we read, Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he, the angel of the Lord, touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Now, the Fong also say things so much like the Bible. They love to speak in these kinds of proverbial ways. Genesis 13, 16, for example, sounds exactly like a Fong person would say it. Yahweh says to Abraham, If a man can count the dust of earth, he will also be able to count your descendants. So that's a really kind of a strange way to say it for us in English, but for a fong, it just fits like a glove. They also have a rich tradition of using rhetorical questions and indirect rhetoric. So if you look at a version of the Old Testament like the English Standard Version, you're going to find a lot of use of rhetorical questions that doesn't really fit with the way we talk in English exactly. But in fong, it fits every time. Every time. So that parallels perfectly. Now, what about these weird things that we see in Genesis, for example, where somebody asks somebody else to put their hand under their thigh and swear to them? So, for instance, this happens with Jacob. Jacob asks Joseph to put his hand under his thigh and swear that he won't bury him in Egypt but with his fathers. Now, that whole thing, that whole tradition is actually talking about touching somebody's private parts. That's what most scholars believe is happening there. So, Jacob would technically be asking Joseph to touch his private parts while he swears to him or promises him something. How does that fit with Fong culture? Well, it's really interesting. This brought up something with Acacio. He said that Spouses who loved each other very much and wanted to take an oath that they will never sleep with another besides each other, they would take that oath traditionally by touching each other's private parts 
just like Abraham's servant put his hand under his master's quote-unquote thigh before he went to find Isaac a wife. Now, also related to that, the Fong would traditionally take oaths by stepping over medicine or other objects, or it could be a machete, and calling curses on themselves if they don't fulfill the oath. So they could say, you know, for instance, may the machete kill me if I don't dot dot dot, which is so similar to the blood covenant that Yahweh makes with Abraham. I don't know if you remember that scene in Genesis 15 where they make that covenant, but you can look that up if you don't. This is already getting really long, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this whole list by the time I need to wrap this up. Let's let's look at another one here. The word remes in Hebrew is the word which sometimes is translated as creeping things or reptiles. But this word refers not only to reptiles like snakes, lizards, or turtles, but also to insects, rodents, and all kinds of small animals. And this is exactly what the Fung have a word for. It's olongolong, which is plural, or along. Now, unfortunately, if a translator had looked up many translations in Spanish that simply put reptiles, this would have sent him on a quest to find some word for a category they don't share with the Western scientific world. And instead, in Fong, their category fits more exactly with the ancient Near Eastern category than ours does because we think in these modern scientific categories. So that was really fascinating that they were able to more clearly and more accurately communicate what that word in Hebrew means with one equivalent word in their language than we can in English. So they have a huge advantage over us with little things like that. And I told this to people on multiple occasions. Look, you guys want to read the Bible in Spanish. I realize that. You're all trying to move towards Spanish. You're all trying to use Spanish in your churches. You're all just letting your your language, Fung, fade into oblivion. But here's what the advantage is. If you guys had the Bible in Fung, if you had the Old Testament in Fung, and you read that and studied it in your churches, you would really understand it a lot better than you would in Spanish just for these things, much less the language issue. But for all of these kinds of parallels and these kinds of word advantages that you have, it would be amazing and it would come to life in a way you never saw it before. Anyway, let's look at another one. The Fong have pure and impure animals. Can you believe that? (laughs) Not the same ones as in the Bible, but they have those categories crazy. Also, in their culture, the blood is considered the life of a being. This is why in witchcraft, they drink the blood of certain clean animals so that they benefit from that creature's life and become strong or healed. It's the exchange of life for life in their minds. That sounds like the most ridiculous, bizarre, crazy, insane, offensive thing to us as modern Westerners. But at the end of the day, you know what? They have an advantage because of this mindset for understanding the gospel in a deeper way than we can. The Fong also bless others. That is a tradition in their culture, especially their children. When a father is about to die, people make sure that he blesses his family. They have a formulaic introduction to giving an official blessing. So in our recordings, we always had this formulaic introduction that they use traditionally before somebody like Jacob would bless you know, his son or whoever. Some of the imagery of the formula is as follows. May your family and wealth be as long as the vines of the jungle. May you cross where the antelope crosses, which means that you will follow the example and advice of the wise. 
May you go from muddy water to pure water. And finally, may you take all that is unclean and throw it in the river where it will be washed away. So that's pretty awesome. And this formulaic introduction seems to be one that's very ancient to their culture. For the Fang, mankind was originally created immortal. But when woman introduced witchcraft into the world, there came with it hate, ignorance, pride, and death. Another very interesting similarity parallel. When Abraham says that Sarah is his sister, the Fang would see this as something fairly normal that they would be prone to do in a similar situation. The woman would see this as something normal as well and as her duty to help protect them both. This happens most with the Fang of Cameroon in the present day, is what I hear. So when they travel to neighboring countries, they often do this and sometimes it's a means of income. So that means that the wife is exchanging sex for money. Now also, traditionally, for the Fang, hospitality is the paramount virtue, just like it was for ancient Israel, especially Abram. So you read those passages. He brings out, he kills an animal for the guests. He doesn't even know these people. They're strangers. He puts you know the red carpet out for them, basically. And that kind of mentality is very integral to Fang culture. Okay, I think we're going to be able to squeeze these in here. I'll keep going. Uh, Hebrew, this is really interesting. Hebrew often switches between third person and second person within the same context or paragraph. So if you read the Psalms, you've probably seen this a million times where it's talking to you, O Lord, and then talks about the Lord in the third person does this. The Lord is a mighty warrior. You, O Lord, I... To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, whatever. And believe it or not, this is totally normal in Fang to do this. The Fang also have a tree that has a strong smell like an onion when it's cut, which can be mixed in a medicine stew for helping women to bear children, just like mandrakes. Then we've got... This passage in Genesis 30, verse 3, where Rachel says, Here is my servant, Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my knees. That's how it says it in Hebrew. That she may give birth on my knees, which means on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. In Fang, you would say the same thing for a similar kind of service but it would be thighs instead of knees. The story of Dinah is also something right out of Fang culture. From the trickery to the bride price and other requests, it's exactly how it would play out if it happened in EG. Some of the idioms they have for falling in love are, I love you with the love of another place. That is the dimension of witchcraft they're implying there. I love you with the love of another place. I love you with the love of Evu, which is the power of witchcraft. Or I love you with the love of the dead. They also have a traditional idiom for offering to exchange daughters between tribes. So if, since that was something that happened back in the day for the Fang, they actually had a way of saying this. Their idiom was something to the effect of, let's cut the head of a pig and share it. That's how they would say that. Let's share our daughters between our tribes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again for listening this far. If you enjoy this podcast, do me a favor, share it with others, subscribe, write a review. That encourages me to keep going and also helps other people find this podcast so they can be edified or find something interesting to pass the time during quarantine so here at working for the word we believe that the bible is a unified god-breathed god-centered hope-giving book sweeter than honey 
and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.